Hi everyone, it's Rob and thanks for listening in today. I greatly appreciate your time. As co-CEO, I'm humbled to share this is our 30th year in business. I'm not that old, am I? How did this happen? Anyway, today my guest is Pavan Gupta. He is an engineer by qualification from India Engineering and Technology or IET. Think MIT in the United States. And he is founder of the Society for the Integrated Development of the Himalayas or SIDH. SIDH started in 1989 when community members from villages around Missouri, India, which is located 177 miles or 285 kilometers from New Delhi in the northern part of India, approached Pavan and his wife with a request to start a school for their children. Three years later, women from some of those same villages told Pavan that their children had been ruined by the new education. And this unexpected feedback is what kickstarted an introspective journey to explore and understand the idea of quality in education. Over the last 30 years, SIDH has worked to provide access to education in over 40 villages in India. In these years, SIDH stood witness to the transformation of local self-reliant cultures. For SIDH, the key issue facing today's society is that of the individual vis-a-vis -vis the community. What does it mean to quote unquote, educate an individual while allowing and enabling his or her community to be destroyed? To challenge this modern trend, SIDH started its experiments with educational curricula and sought to reorient the focus of study to the issues facing the local ecology and culture. Inspired by Mahatma Gandhi's foundational education, SIDH has been committed to the idea that schools should be at the center of community life. And they have done pioneering work in developing innovative teaching material, in particular handbooks for teachers that utilize the local environment, physical and social, as the medium for facilitating learning and education. I have to tell you, this is a thought-provoking conversation, and I encourage you, please listen closely, maybe even more than once, because we cover some deep thinking today, and there are many nuggets of wisdom that will help you to lead with genuine care with everyone, every day, every time, and of course, with yourself. And I wanna express my deep gratitude for all of your support and gratitude to my friends Ashish and Jimpa, as well as the team here at Image One for helping to make leading with genuine care a real difference maker in this, in this world. And if you haven't added your name to our email list, please do so if you're compelled. Go to donothingbook.com. If you're a regular listener, you know we've had many important conversations with some really amazing people. And so if you're inspired, please feel free to share the podcast with your friends, coworkers, and people in your network. Okay, so without further ado, please enjoy my chat with Pavan. Pavan, welcome to the Leading with Genuine Care podcast. I'm so grateful that you've joined me today. Thank you, Rob. It's a privilege. It, it's a privilege for me. You it, first, I, I just wanted to start by saying how grateful I am to this universe because I can speak with somebody like you. You're if I last time we spoke and you may be in the same place, you were at the base of the Himalayan mountains, Himalayan mountains. I want to say you're like nine or 10 hours from New Delhi in India. Less. I'm only about six hours away. If you take a flight, then the flight is only 40 minutes and then it's a one hour drive to my place. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. So you're in a sort of a more remote area? Well, the place where I stay is not so remote. It's a hill station which was, start, uh, you know, sort of built up by the British uh, in the uh, nine, early 19th century. 
And uh, it's a small town with a population of about 60,000 people. But we have a lot of tourist traffic here. Ah. Uh, but where I work, which is uh, north of Missouri, uh, that is, you can call it a remote area, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, through the through the technology that we have nowadays for us to be able to speak like this, it's just um, something I'm very grateful to be able to see you and be able to hear you and be able to broadcast the, broadcast this so others can uh, hear uh, some of the wisdom that that I think we'll uncover today that you've gained throughout your life. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, right. Let's see. I, I, my self-image is not that of a very wise man. Uh, I've done very many foolish things in my life in retrospect, uh, and I still keep doing, but uh, whatever I've learned, I will definitely like to share with you. It's a journey. Um, I was reading a book that our mutual friend Ashish uh, shared mm -hmm. with me. Right. Um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's an interview with, uh, and I, if I mispronounce this, please let me know, Samdang Rinpoche. That's right. And I, I thought when I was preparing for a conversation, I, I thought I'd just flip through it and see kind of where I landed and if anything resonated. And I, mm -hmm. I, there's this short part here I just wanted to read to you and get your thoughts on. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rinpoche is speaking about Gandhi. And he right. says, Gandhi was of the opinion that a person who keeps more than his real needs is holding on to a material that is not his share. Someone else's share is being kept by that person. And I just wanted to, I was curious what your thoughts on that might be. Yeah. The, I uh, uh, must uh, tell you that... Uh, uh, you know, after coming to Missouri, and I stumbled upon uh, what I'm doing now, which is, you know, working in the area of education. Uh, why I say stumbled? Because uh, I had no intention. I had no planning. Uh, I just went into the villages out of more out of curiosity and uh, to see these beautiful little Himalayan villages and to get to know their culture. But, uh, you know, after a while, these villagers asked me to open a school. Uh, they had no schools in that area at that time. Or they had, but very few, like one out of seven or eight villages would have a school. Uh, and I, coming from an urban background, uh, having been educated uh, in uh, a good uh, institute in India, I later on realized that we people somehow start having this huge arrogance about us being educated and these poor deprived villagers, we start looking down upon them as backward and illiterate and uneducated. Uh, but uh, soon I realized that that was not the case. Uh, it was only my perception and my perception was flawed. And then I started uh, trying to understand uh, what they were actually saying, what they were meaning. The words are one thing, but the uh, meaning behind it is far more important. And sometimes what we derive, what how we interpret the other's words uh, may be different from what the reality is. And uh, so, uh, you know, I uh, uh, started looking at them very closely and many things I couldn't understand. And Mahatma Gandhi actually helped me. I've never met the man. He, he died before even I was born. But I read, I started reading him extensively. And uh, I realized from through his writings, I could understand, I could interpret the villagers uh, where I was working. Uh, so I consider Mahatma Gandhi uh, as a person who had deep insight about ordinary people, about civilizational values, about the importance of cultural, uh, uh, what should I say, knowledge systems, and also uh, the foundations of their belief systems. 
I started understanding these things of which I was just not aware only after uh, through the writings of Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, I, frankly speaking, some of the things he says, like the one you just read out, uh, I can sort of understand where he's coming from because he was a great believer in the concept of trusteeship, which actually comes from uh, a very deep, Indian civilizational insight where the belief is that everything is provided by nature. Uh, you know, we may have a lot of things that we use today, for instance, this technology, these computers and mobile phones and what have you, but ultimately all these material stuff comes out of nature. They are a transformed form of something which already exists it could be coal or it could be petroleum or it could be some mineral or the other, but it's a, we only human beings can only transform them and make it into a, uh, something new, something which we use, but ultimately it comes from nature. And uh, that, is, that has its limits, we all know. I mean, resources have their limits. So uh, the Indian belief has been that, uh, you know, the, no one owns it. The, na, whatever is there in nature, no human being really owns it. You, even if you acquire something, it is for you to, to uh, you are a trustee of that. And, and you must use it, you must utilize it very carefully. You should, there is no concept of wastage in this, in this thought. So you must do the right utilization. You must not do, waste it. And you, sh you are not supposed to consume it for your own uh, sensorial pleasures alone. You know, to, up to a certain limit, that is okay. But beyond a point, it is uh, actually sinful or it is uh, actually detrimental to the entire uh, well-being of the universe and all the uh, living beings, all the sentient beings living in this universe. So Mahatma Gandhi picked up this idea and that's what he is saying, that uh, uh, he was a great believer in frugality. And uh, uh, therefore, this I understand this uh, quote that you are quoting uh, as, from coming from there. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense but, you know, the way uh, the world is going, it's very, very difficult today to actually uh, uh, adhere to that kind of a thing completely. I mean, even, up, I mean, I find it very difficult because sometimes you end up, you're flying, for instance, you know, you're going from one place to another and you're flying. And you, one knows that how much of... Uh, carbon uh, emission is there and you know what kind of you know if you calculate the cost then it's huge and uh, sometimes you wonder whether it's really worth it you know you're making that kind of a journey but then you know that's the way it is but Mahatma Gandhi uh, yes he was he he, uh, he lived frugally and he uh, mostly practiced what he said not not entirely because uh, I mean, and he has spoken about that too. You know, once he was traveling in a train uh, and he was writing against technology uh, while sitting in the train and he sent that letter to a friend and that person said that, how can you do that? You're sitting in a train, you know, talking against technology. And he says that, don't think that I'm a fool. Of course, I'm very, very aware. As you wouldn't even know that I was traveling in a train uh, you only came to know because I wrote in that letter mm -hmm. that I while while on the journey to while in a, while in a train on the way to Simla. So he says though that uh, he he is very aware of the contradictions of modern life, and uh, but yet he feels that uh, uh, certain things are wrong and uh, uh, they need to be ultimately corrected. Mm. Probably this is not the time because, you know, I mean, 
I see Mahatma Gandhi's uh, a pain in him uh, because he's very, very aware of the eternal truth. And he's also aware, acutely aware of the transitory truth, you know, truth which we, you and I are living in, the reality which is transitory, but it is a reality all the same. But we all also are aware of what is the ultimate truth. So the contradiction between the eternal truth and the transitory truth or the temporal truth is a struggle which most of us, uh, you know, at least those people who are sensitive, they are all the time struggling with this. And mm. Mahatma Gandhi is talking about it all the time. Yes. Mm. Could you talk about each one of those truths in the meaning for those that might not understand? Yeah, I mean, see, uh, one of the things that I have recently, uh, I, I contemplate on it a lot, is <clears throat> what is the meaning of truth? Now, the general perception today is that there is no absolute truth. You know, each one to his own truth. But that is, doesn't make sense because each one has their own perception. Yes, you have a different perception. I have a different perception. You, may, you have a different taste. I have a different taste. You have some likes and dislikes, and I have different likes and dislikes. I have a certain, I hold on to certain ideology. You hold on to a certain ideology. I may have a certain opinion, and you may have a different opinion. We differ in all these things, but the ultimate truth is the same. I mean, for instance, the water at a certain pressure will boil at 100 degrees centigrade, whether in America or in India or 100 years ago or you know, 100 years after. That doesn't change. That, is a, that falls in the category of eternal truth. Or for instance, to give you another example, uh, you know, all human beings like to be respected. They feel good when they are respected. I, even if I don't know a person or you don't know a person, but as long as the person is a human being, you can be sure that this person likes to be respected. I, anim, this, this issue is not there with the animals. I'm not putting, I'm not saying that human beings are superior to animals or anything like that. All I'm saying is human beings are different from animals. So for instance, if a if an animal is hungry, if a cat is hungry, you throw a crumb at the cat and the, the cat will perhaps eat it, you know. But if you throw a crumb at a hungry human being, he will hesitate. He will not like to eat it. He will like to eat it if the food is given with respect, you know. So this is the difference between, an, between the animals and human beings. Mm. Human beings like to be respected. They also feel good when they respect another person. Whether they do or not is a different question. But whenever they are able to respect the other, they feel good. Mm. The other also feels good. So there are many such things which are fall in the category of eternal truth. They do not change with time or space or location. So Mahatma, this is, the, this is what I mean by eternal truth. And uh, uh, the temporal truth is... Uh, you know, for instance, uh, uh, sometimes uh, we end up doing things which uh, we know in uh, uh, we know very well that we don't like doing. You know, but we end up doing because of the compulsions of the time. Sometimes, I mean, see, corrupt. We talk a lot about corruption. Some of the corruption is because I want something to be, I'm very selfish and I want some to derive an extra benefit and therefore I do corruption. But many times you are doing things which are not right because you find there's no other option you, and you are forced to do it, you know. Uh, so that falls in the category of temporal uh, I mean, transient reality. 
And this conflict between eternal and transient is what I'm talking of. This is human life. You know, we keep struggling and trying to find our way so that we are, uh, uh, we don't have these pangs of conscience. Mm. You know, you know. I, I'd like to get your feedback as I relate it to, I'm in the United States yeah. and there's a lot of division in terms of um, the ideology of the country and where people want it to be, what they want it to be like, uh, what type of government do they want? And it's very uh, even, evenly divided if you look at the most recent election. And what is the truth around that? And how can we as, as citizens in, in this particular country, in this society, uh, show up and lead with genuine care together. I think education is the key, uh, you know, and there are no, I don't, personally speaking, I don't see that there are any quick fix solutions or there are any immediate solutions. But yes, I do think that uh, long-term solutions are there if we, if we work uh, in the area of education and if we are able to um, you see the modern mind has been categorized uh, the, all our value system and I see it so clearly in India when I see an ordinary so called not so educated ordinary Indian uh, and an educated Indian I find a sharp contrast the so-called uneducated, illiterate Indian is, lives his life by and large based on values, human values, like truth, honesty, and uh, cooperation, and compassion, and uh, kindness. All these things you will find, I'm not saying they are, I mean, I'm not, I, my, I'm generalizing with the with, with, uh, uh, I mean, uh, gender, it's always a problem generalizing things. Yeah. But I find that they are by and large living by their personal values, which they have got through their family, through their uh, communities, through their traditions. But educated people like me, we have, we live, we, tr we live by values which have been externalized. You know, what I mean by that is, that, for instance, what are the modern values? Modern values are freedom. Modern values are uh, my right to be able to do as I please. You know, and no one is teaching me that you cannot live like that. You cannot live by your desires alone. Your desires need to be aligned with the way things are, ultimately. For instance, I can't no one stops me from eating whatever I like. I can eat, definitely eat what I like. But that does not mean that I'll remain healthy. If I want to be healthy, which is the basic value, then I have to understand, and this comes from education, what is right food for to keep my body healthy. If I do that, then my, I'll be healthy. But the the concept of freedom today is telling me that you can eat what you like. Who's there to stop you? No one should stop you. Right? So I, and I have no education which has told me that this is right food, this is not right food, this is healthy food, this is not unhealthy food. No one tells me that. You know? So I, the only thing I know is that I have the right to eat what I like. And I go and spoil my, my health. The same thing happens in different dimensions of life. So the idea of freedom, it, it's, it's basically just an idea. There is no reality to it unless it is, uh, it is uh, uh, controlled, should I say, I don't have the right word, but it, it gets aligned with the right understanding. Mm -hmm. And the right under, by right understanding, I mean the way existence is the way my body is built, if I understand that, from that it will come that, yes, this is good food for you and this is not right food for you. 
Similarly, if I want to be happy, if I want to be contented, if I want to be satisfied, if I want to be peaceful, then there are certain things that I have must do with that understanding, with the understanding of the way existence is. And if I do that, then an outcome of that is satisfaction. An outcome of that is being in peace. You know, you cannot go and have peace if you don't have that understanding. This is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's always a short-term solution. You know, you, you buy peace. You know, the word, you buy your peace. That's not peace, really. That's a compromise. And that's sometimes manipulation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people work their whole lives with the idea that peace is a decade away for them or two decades away. What are your thoughts around that? How can we reset our minds? Yeah, my thoughts are, see, it's all, as I said, it, everything has been externalized. Everything has its focus. The focus is on materialism. So when people say it's a 10 years away, the peace is 10 years away, mostly I think they would mean that once I have so much money, once I have a house and I have this and I have my children are, uh, you know, they, they, they have studied and they are on their own and then I will have peace. This is all externalization because peace is, some, is a mental state. You know, once if, I mean, I, I like to bring a, the, the reality of uncertainty here. You see, I started looking at uncertainty. And when I started looking at uncertainty, I found that uncertainty was a reality. It is omnipresent, ever present, all the time it is present. You and I are talking on through this internet today. And you just said that if something goes wrong, then we will do an audio recording. <laughs> that is uncertain, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the power may go off. The, uh, the connectivity may go off. It's all very uncertain. Everything is uncertain. I mean, when we, are, we have accidents, you're walking on the road and suddenly you twist your ankle and, you know, you, 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 you were walking fine. You were not doing anything funny, but it just happened. So it happens both ways. It happens in a positive way. It happens in a negative way. But it, the possibility of that happening is ever present. If that, if you, uh, uh, if you pay attention to it, then you realize that if there is uncertainty, then planning is important. But things have will not go exactly the way you want them to. I mean, there are so many known, of course, known factors, but there are so many unknown factors which play a role in the way future unfolds. And I'm not being fatalistic here. I'm saying, of course, your effort is important. Of course, the known factors are important. But there are, in, despite that, there are innumerable unknown factors. The whole a uh, world of uncertainty is there, which plays a hidden role in the unfolding of events, the unfolding of the future. So this 10 years hence, it will be like that, carries an assumption that I am the only doer, which is not a reality, which is not a truth. You are not the only, you are one of the several doers. You are one of the several factors. You may be a very important factor, but you are not the only factor. So therefore, you know, once you see that, then you relax in the sense that you let things happen. You play your part. You play your part according to that understanding of the reality and let things happen. So you eat healthy food but that doesn't mean that you're never going to fall sick. You may, but you do your best, you know, and let things take their uh, uh, course. Uh, that state of mind is a peaceful state of mind. Mm. According, you know. Well, what about, let's talk a little bit about intention. Uh, let's say 
I decide to use your food example. I decide I want to live a physically more healthy life and I'm going to change my diet and focus on what I understand to be the most healthy foods that fuel this body to keep me as healthy as possible. Um, and then you say, but you still might get sick. What about this? In, I'm an entrepreneur in the United States. And uh, one of the things that we do as entrepreneurs and one of the things that we do at my company is we encourage our team members to create a vision for their future, a vivid vision, what it looks like, what they're moving towards 10 years into the future, what their life might look like. And then we have them break it down. What, where do you, what, what does it look like in three years? And, and what does it look like one year from now? And what are specific goals that you want to accomplish? So how do we take that and fit it into this idea that, that you're talking about with uncertainty? Is it worth it? I would say, yes, it, what you're doing is definitely uh, uh, something which is important and one must do. One must have vision is absolutely uh, something that is uh, uh, perhaps necessary uh, because, you know, once you have a vision, you have a dream, then that gives you a sense of direction, where to move, you know. Uh, so that gives you a sense of direction. The problem is not with the direction. The problem is with specific events happening. You know, that because there are more than one ways of reaching your goal. Always, you know. So if you are very fixated on your journey, I find that a bit of a uh, issue. If you are fixated on the vision, that's not an issue at all. Be reach that vision or to go in that direction, you may you have the flexibility that you can keep. You know, you change your uh, 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 change your route, change your uh, 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 the road that you are taking from time to time, depending on the circumstances, the the direction is there. But if you are too fixated on particular events, they, uh, I think that is something that I would avoid mm -hmm. because it may not happen the way you want. You may reach your journey, but in a very completely different way. So let's be open to that. Let's be open to the, to, to the uncertainty which is there. I mean, in English, there is a phrase, there's many a slip between the cup and the lip. <laughs> right? I mean, it is a very important idiom or phrase because in that small journey between the cup and the lip, one foot distance, you, there can be many a slip. You, you never know. So let's be aware of it. Awareness is all that is required. Mm -hmm. Awareness and a little humility that I am not the only doer. Yes, I have this vision. Yes, I'm going to take the first step. But let me be open to uncertainty. Let me be open that things may not go exactly the way I want them to go. Mm -hmm. You know, so I am, I, that this kind of understanding gives you a certain humility and relaxes you ultimately. It takes the burden off your back, so to say. That doesn't mean that you become lazy. It doesn't mean that you are not responsible. But you are responsible, but with in a relaxed manner. That you are doing your best, but it is not in your hands. The outcome is not in your hands. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about uh, the awareness. And I'm curious, what thoughts do you have around how one can cultivate a greater awareness between the, I don't know if I'm going to say it right, but as, as uh, between that sip and slip, you know, how, how can we cultivate that in our lives? You know, uh, I don't know, Rob, if I'm going to answer your question directly, but I, if something comes to my mind, I just thought of it the other day. You know, uh, we are, I mean, when we observe, we are not observing fully. For instance, if I observe an activity like walking, a simple activity like walking, 
I look at it that my legs are moving, I have the intention to walk, I, my uh, movement's happening, the, there's something happening in the body, and I say, this is walking. But I'm not looking at the context. For, what, by that I mean, I cannot walk unless there is something solid ben be beneath my feet. For instance, if I'm in water, I cannot walk. If I'm in the air, not in an airplane, but if I'm in the air, say in a balloon or something, or in skydiving or something, I cannot walk. So for walking, that activity of walking is not just me, but it is it happens only in combination with something solid beneath my feet. If I'm swimming, then it's not only me swimming, but I need some liquid to be able to swim, right? So when we are looking at swim, the activity of swimming, we also have to see the liquid. When we are looking at walking, we also have to look at the, uh, the, uh, the context uh, on what I'm standing on. So observation needs to be, awareness needs to be of the entire, entirety, in its entirety, not just focused on one particular thing, because things are, they're always something on which this other thing is dependent on. So we are only looking at one, we are not looking at the other. Now, if we start paying attention, then these things start getting revealed. You know, it starts getting even something as simple as watching your breath. You know, there's a lot of meditation exercises in which they talk about awareness about your breath. But what are you watching in your breath? There are hundreds of different ways you can watch your breath. Right. Once you start observing your breath, that there, maybe in the beginning you need a teacher or you need a guide to tell you that, look, now watch the temperature of your breath. You know, incoming breath and outgoing breath is the same temperature or is one warmer than the other? Then you suddenly become aware, oh yeah, incoming breath is cooler and outgoing breath is warmer. Then you, where, where does the breath touch you? Which parts of your nose or nostrils or, you know, wherever, where, where are you feeling this breath? That's another way of watching. Is it slow? Is it fast? That's another way of watching. Is, it, is there an interval between incoming and outgoing? That's another way of watching. So it's the same thing that when we say, watch your breath, watch the way you walk, watch your thoughts, there are so many aspects of that one little small thing. So in the beginning, maybe you need a facilitator or a guide or someone to tell you that this is not, there's not one way of watching it. There are so many different ways. And once you become aware of those that, yes, there are more than one way, then I think slowly, your mind starts looking at, no, this is not the only way. Maybe there's another way. Maybe there's other, other aspects are missing out. And that's how your awareness keeps on increasing. You know? And once that happens, then I think the test is that you start watching the gaps. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. Gaps are very important in anything, anything. The gaps, the intervals where sort of everything stops, you know. If you are able to see that, then you can tell the person now, you know, you don't need any more guidance. Perhaps you, you can move forward on your own. Mm -hmm. So observation is something that is not there in education. It's just simply not there. The, it's such a powerful thing. Observation, awareness, we have different names. And then contemplation. You know, look at today's education. I mean, you know, people are, we call a person very smart when the person is asking questions. You know, this is the general understanding that the more a person asks questions, the more intelligent the person is. But I think far more important is to ask a genuine question. A question which comes out of deep reflection, you know, and a question which is comes from the depth of your being. If 
and it is more and if it is pointed so much the better and you modern mind has been trained to get an answer immediately <laughs> you know unless it gets an answer it's it, it's very agitated and the answer may be false the answer may be completely wrong but you know must get an answer and what is more important is to stay with the question and be with it and sometimes real questions real uh, genuine questions they they have the power to reveal themselves if you stay with them this is something which is completely missing in our education whether it is in america or it is in india we are not doing enough in you know observation awareness contemplation silence you know we are the mind is chattering all the time the mind is seeking answers immediately and trying to show how smart you are and all this you know you shared a story with me uh, that i'm hoping you can can share about one of your schools and uh, there was a mother i believe it was that um, uh, spoke with you about i think it was the curriculum and how maybe there was something that was missing about just letting the kids be could you yeah, yeah, share yeah. that yeah yeah that was in the right in the beginning you know i i this again you know coming from an urban english educated background you know i had i i mean i carried this huge arrogance you know i mean all of us carry all the all educated you know it was not something unique to me we think we know you know we are educated we've got a degree <coughs> so when i <clears throat> started teaching this was 30 years ago 31 years ago and uh, one day this wise woman from the i mean i didn't know she was so wise i and later on started respecting her a lot she said you know your this education and he was she was not meaning my school she was just making a general statement she said your education is ruining our children ruin our children that were exact words in, translated into english i was shocked you know she said you know you must teach them how to be not how to look not how to appear not how to pretend not how to you know this looking good and being good are two different things she taught me that day that look we all can look good you know but are we really good you know we can all appear to be very honest but are we really honest we can all appear to be very in, you know highly knowledgeable but are we actually so so this distinction between what the impression that you give this whole persona you know this emphasis on in modern times on your persona you know personality cultivation formalities you know how you behave which is not authentic many times and being authentic and genuine and in your being how you are this distinction was not there in my mind she made me aware of it and i think she gave me a clue to to how what education must be and what it is doing you know today it is all about externalization how you appear how you look how you behave this whole this word smart gets me you know i mean you know everyone is trying to look smart right <laughs> no one is trying to be genuine no one is trying to be authentic even if they do that is to show that how you you are genuine you know and that, this is the problem with the modern person this this unhappiness this tension in the modern person is between what he actually is and what he the projection that he, he the the projection that he makes this 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 uh, uh, distance between the two this complete dissonance between the two it creates the uh, creates the tension creates the unhappiness primarily so she was the one who pointed it out to me and then i read mahatma gandhi and he in his one of his writings he says 
that this modern education, he's talking in this in 19, you know, early 20th century. And he says this modern education, this modern English education, which was brought by the British, has created a huge distance between the home and the school. So a child wears different clothes at home, but when he goes to school, he wears different clothes. He sits in a different way at home. He sits cross-legged. He sits on the floor, but he sits cross-legged. You know, even our Rajas and Maharajas would sit cross-legged. But when he goes to school, he sits in a bench or a chair where the feet are touching the ground, but his uh, you know, upper part is on a bench. So he's not sitting cross-legged. He is uh, speaking a different language at home. He's speaking a different language in school. So every cultural aspect is different in school from what it is at home. And this has created a huge problem. The problem being that the child thinks that this, what school represents, is superior. And the, what is represented at home is inferior. And therefore, he starts copying without understanding. He starts imitating without understanding what is represented in school. So this gives him a certain inferiority complex at one level and creates a tension at another level and makes him an imitator, you know. And this is what the woman is saying, that teach them to be, not how to look, how to appear, and all that. Mm. Well, how can we, in our modern society, <clears throat> how can we be, you know, be our more authentic selves? Well, we can talk about some fundamentals in school. It's not very really difficult, you know. I've done it in my school. For instance, I uh, one of the pet uh, things that I do in school is I ask the children, what is the difference between word and meaning? And <laughs> not no, most of them have never been asked this question. They are familiar with the word word. They're familiar <laughs> with the word meaning, but they have never thought about it and they start thinking and then you know normally I don't get a good answer but then I explain because it gives me an opening they have they I have hooked them by this question I have got their attention and that is what I wanted then I say water is a word but the meaning of water is it the word or is it something else and then I say, it quenches your thirst. That is the meaning of water. It douses a fire. That is the meaning of water, etc., etc. It is wet. That is the meaning of water. And water as a reality is something that you can see, you can drink, you can feel, you, you know. So there is a reality of water. There, is, there are attributes to that reality. That is the meaning of water. And then this word, water. The word is in a language. In English, we call it water. In Hindi, we call it pani. In some other language, we call it aqua, etc., etc. <laughs> so, the, you know, the first time they start, and then I ask them, what is more important between the two? Word or the meaning? And they say, oh, meaning. And I say, meaning remains the same, irrespective of the language, right? Yeah. So the word is a given by us in language. So what is important is the meaning. And then my entire thing, what I do is to again and again bring their attention to the reality, to the actual meaning, which is beyond language. So once they get into this habit, they will it's it's the good chances that they will not get swayed by uh, you know what is fed to them through the media through other means you know the like the fashion world the world of fashion it keeps changing but once you understand why you wear clothes you, if you really get into this what is the value in in the clothes that you wear there are two paradigms, one the paradigm of value and the paradigm of price. The
the paradigm of price is the fashion of the day. The paradigm of price is what the money you give to buy that particular thing. And this paradigm keeps changing. It's the transient paradigm. It's an imposed paradigm. But the value of cloth is that it protects your body it, uh, from weather conditions. Well, and your aesthetic sense, your own personal aesthetic sense, which differs from person to person. So you wear your clothes because you want to protect your body and because you want to feel good. You, you want to uh, manifest your own aesthetic sense through your, the clothes that you wear. That's it. Now, once you get that, then you know, the chances are you won't get swayed by the fashion of the day. You become more grounded. You, you know, you take things in back into your own hands rather than let the market or the media or the outside forces govern you all the time. <laughs> the same thing happens when, you know, if you, if you, I talk a lot about the difference between knowledge and information. You know, no, information keeps changing from time to time. Information is, uh, you know, like who's the prime minister of the country. Now, what is true today was not true 10 years ago, is not going to be true after five years. So it keeps changing. But knowledge is something which does not change. Two plus two remains four. It will always remain four, if you understand it. So knowledge is, today, there's a complete complete confusion between knowledge and information. In fact, they're saying information is knowledge. You know, they're saying information is knowledge. Information is never knowledge. Information may be powerful, but it's not knowledge. These are two different categories. Same thing between truth and fact. You know, fact is the temperature where I'm sitting right now is 10 degrees centigrade. Where you are there, maybe it's something else. That's a fact, but that does not fall into category of truth. So the, I have created a list of distinctions. And I believe that if these, the understanding, the cobwebs in the minds are cleared, then you become more confident of taking decisions which are yours, not governed only by the outside. I mean, you have to take the outside into consideration, of course. But you are not going to allow the outside to govern you, to take control of you. This is what, uh, you know, I mean, education must do. And mm -hmm. this can be done, you know, I think. Mm -hmm. I have one last question for you. And you've been somebody who has learned over your, your life to tap into your intuition. And I'm wondering if you can share with us how we might be able to better tap into our intuition. <clears throat> I don't really, I, 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 I don't know if there's a method to it, but I believe that if you can really give attention to, again, I'm repeating myself, to the infinite domain of the unknown. It is ever present. Every time we make a new discovery, that discovery is a manifestation of something from the unknown into the world of the known, both at the personal level and at the macro level, at the collective level. A discovery in science, let's say, in Newton, I mean, we say that he just, he discovered uh, gravity. Gravity was always there, but it was lying in the domain of the unknown. You know, he only pulled it out from there and put it in the domain of the known. known. You don't know about something and suddenly you come to know, but I know that thing. But as far as you are concerned, that was lying in the domain of the unknown. So if you pay attention, this uncertainty is nothing but a manifestation of the unknown into the known from time to time. So if you start paying attention to this, you create, you, you develop real humility into the vast and infinite domain of the unknown, which I call God. And 
if that is real i mean i'm not asking anyone to believe it i want everyone to pay attention to it and then if you do that and you also then say that there are any thought that strikes you you know we claim it is my thought but actually sometimes i feel that the origins of the thought were not not nothing to do with you it just came to you it struck you you know if you go into the source of it believe in that and you know become a little light in the sense don't take so much burden that you are the only doer and then i think this faculty called intuition has a chance to manifest itself and be open to it be open to it and this opening also can come if you believe if you start looking at the unknown and the uncertainty then this this hap- this may happen i mean i'm i'm not sure but i mean this is what i believe in i yeah. pay attention and yeah it works for me thank you so much pavan i greatly appreciate everything we had a chance to talk about today no thank you it's been a pleasure yeah and uh in helping us think more about how we can use some of the wisdom that you shared with us today although i know you're so humble uh about that I, which i greatly appreciate as well but how we can use this to better lead with each other with genuine care with with everyone every day every time you know really think about how we go about our lives and and maybe uh being open to ideas that that you've shared with us today and to everybody listening the loyal listeners i greatly appreciate you spending time with us and as always i wish you much love and gratitude 